Uh, I'm very pleased this year we had this our third multi faith event. Uh, the Brahma Kabanis came to us and said, Can you be part of your festival? We'd like to organize a multi faith event. <clears throat> the leaders of East did the same. And in the meantime, I was already, Catherine had contacted me from Rinfania, and we were organizing something. <laughs> and why not have three multi faith events? Uh, and it has been no problem finding speakers, finding a Jewish speaker, a Muslim speaker, a Christian speaker, a Baha'i, a Brahma Kamari, a whoever, a Buddhist speaker. We found speakers easily. And I think there is a movement amongst faith traditions that with all the war and all the divisions and all the difficulties countries have in coming together, perhaps the faith traditions have something to offer that is not coming through anywhere else. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do now that Raising Peace is finishing, the festival is finishing today, but perhaps there is room for faith traditions to come together and to speak up for peace, uh, because all our traditions are steeped in peace. Um, so I'll leave it with this, and we'll see what the speakers have to offer. Thank you, Wies. I would like to invite our first speaker, Patricia Garcia. Patricia Garcia Ao, a renowned humanitarian and human rights advocate, has over 20 years of experience in conflict zones like Afghanistan and Rwanda. She was appointed Officer of the Order of, of Australia in 2016 and is a Rotary Peace Fellow. She lectures on peace and human rights at the University of Sydney. Patricia is on the Council of the Sydney Peace Foundation and is part of the Institute for Economics and Peace. So welcome, Patricia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone, and it's uh, absolutely wonderful to be here. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge um, that we're meeting on uh, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their traditional elders, past, present, and emerging. This land always was, always is, and will be Aboriginal land. Firstly, I'd like to thank um, RIGPA and also the Raising Peace Committee um, for organising and hosting this event, particularly um, to mark International Day of Peace. So I want to say happy International Day of Peace to all of you. I'd like to start by um, really talking about um, a report that the Institute for Economics and Peace produced in 2015 which looks at the links between religion and peace. And I've got a um, brief presentation I'd like to start with um, to actually uh, outline what the key, um, if we like, um, findings were of this research report. Um, I work with the Institute for Economics and Peace um, as the Partnerships Development Manager and the Institute for Economics and Peace is an independent, non-political, not-for-profit global think tank uh, that measures and analyzes peace and the economic value of peace. We were founded in 2008, actually by an Australian uh, business entrepreneur, uh, and we're committed to create a shift in the way people think about peace by focusing on peace as a positive measure of human well-being and development. And we do this by providing metrics to measure the definition of peacefulness and also to promote a better understanding of the social, economic, cultural, environmental factors, political factors that drive peace. So I'd like to start. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As I mentioned, um, the aim of um, IEP is actually to create a paradigm shift in the way which people think about peace. You all know that peace is a very multidimensional concept. It means different things to different people. We use it as a gesture every day when we say salam, shalom, 
Shanti, Sukh in the Persian language, as well as peace, pass, pache, patru, all of these meanings. And there are about 350 meanings of peace, um, which is used by many different languages. What we want to talk about today is the work of Institute for Economics Peace in the way they are hoping to want to define peace. IEP, as I said, has got a headquarters where all our research and publications are produced. We're actually based in St. Leonard's, but we have our offices in uh, New York, Mexico City, Brussels, and Nairobi. This is just an example of some of the research that we have produced, which includes um, reports for the United Nations, the World Bank, OECD, and also we have got a lot of our research reports already used in university courses. And you can see here the number of media impressions and also the amount of um, uh, uh, people who come and visit our website. Many of you might know that in 2008, our first report, our flagship report, the Global Peace Index, is a report that actually comes out annually. And the Global Peace Index measures the absence of violence or the fear of violence in 163 countries. Does anyone know where Australia is at the moment out of the 163 countries? Okay. Okay, we're positioned at the moment number 19. Um, Australia's never been in the top 10. Would anyone know what the most most peaceful country is currently? Yes, New Zealand? No, you're very Belgium. close. It's always been Belgium. number two. Belgium. Belgium. Very close. It's Iceland. Iceland has been number one almost for the last, I think, um, eight years running. Mm. And New Zealand has been number two for the last, it's only just gone down in the last couple of years, but New Iceland and New Zealand were the two countries that were in one and two for many, many years. An example of our core reports are the uh, Positive Peace Report. We also produce the Ecological Threat Report and the Global Terrorism Index. And also we do a national country report. Um, oh. Here we are. Sorry about that. Yeah. <clears throat> And you could see here, we also produce a... I'll just move that now and see if it's working. Um, yeah, okay. I'll move on because I don't want to get stuck there with that <laughs> slide. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, as you can see there, these are some of our core reports, but we also do one-off reports. And um, the report I'm going to be talking about now, as I said, is a report on religion and peace. So this is a one-off report that we produced um, in 2015. If you can see here now, I'd like to, to just say that we focused on five key questions to try to answer these five quick questions. And we produce this report to try to address these five key questions. And I'm just going to... Okay. Um... These were the five key questions that we were trying to address in the report. The first one is, uh, is religion the main cause of conflict? Does the proportion of religious belief or atheism in a country determine the peace of the country? Does the demographic spread of Shia and Sunni determine peace? The fourth question, is religion key to understanding what drives peace? And the fourth, uh, fifth uh, question, can religion play a positive role in peace building? So 
What we found from our data As you could see here, 80% of conflicts had more than one cause. You could see the different causes that we found in relation to peace, and you could see where religion is in that light green shade in proportion to the other causes of conflict. 14% of conflicts in 2013 had religion as a driving cause. So 14% of conflicts and then religion was not the sole cause of any armed um, conflict so i think that's a very important statement to be able to show from answering the first question if we're looking at where religion is is it a, a key cause or not it's not it is a cause but as you can see it's not the sole cause of a conflict and this is a very important statement to make Does the proportion of religious beliefs or atheism in a country determine the peace of the country? We found that countries, countries with more atheists are not more peaceful. Three out of 10 most peaceful countries are more religious than the international average. And two of the 10 least peaceful countries have very low rates of religious attendance. So we're here comparing people who have religious beliefs with people who don't have any religious beliefs and how that determines or not whether a country is peaceful. I'll just... There was no statistical relationship between the Global Peace Index, which I mentioned earlier, this is the report that measures the absence of violence or the fear of violence in um, 163 countries. From our Global Peace Index um, uh, scores, there was no relationship between the uh, levels of peacefulness in these countries and the proportion of atheists in a country. In other words, there is no correlation there that you can make between a country's peacefulness and whether or not there's high or low numbers of atheists. The next question, there is no relationship between proportions of Sunni and Shia and the, again, the Global Peace Index, which is the level of peacefulness in a country. So in other words, it doesn't matter how many Sunnis or how many Shiites or which proportions of Sunnis or Shiites there is in a country. That just does not affect the peacefulness of the country. The question religion is not a key driver of peace. The two regions with the most government restrictions towards religion the Middle East, North Africa region and South Asia region are both significantly correlated to the pillar of good relations with neighbours. Yet it appears the other factors have a greater influence on the levels of peace than religion. These factors include corruption, the gross, gross domestic uh, product per capita, inequality, gender, political terror, and intergroup cohesion. In other words, we need to look at these other factors and see how these other factors are having a much stronger influence on conflict compared to religion. And this is a very important, again, another important result of our research. On average, countries with no dominant religious group perform better in the three indices. So we're saying here that countries without a dominant religion are 17% more peaceful than countries with a dominant religion. And government, and however, the government type 
has much greater explanatory power than religion in understanding differing levels of peace. This was an important one to show that often governments who impose restrictions on religions, for example, they don't allow religions to practice they don't allow them to have their churches or mosques or temples. They might not allow them to celebrate their festivals, their day, national days, whatever. Or they may fund certain religions and prefer other religions to others. These are what we call examples of restrictions. Um, in some countries, they, for example, in France, they imposed a law to not allow uh, uh, Muslim women to wear headscarves. There are many restrictions that governments impose and they make it law. And this is a much more stronger ex explanation to, to affecting conflict than the actual religion itself. I hope that makes sense. So we're trying to show you why religion can't be the sole cause because there are so many other factors we have to take into account. And the government restrictions in a country makes a big difference. Now, when a, when a, um, uh, a country has a full democracy or what we call a flawed democracy, when they don't have complete democracy, that's another important factor. And we have here that full democracies perform better in the peacefulness of countries government restrictions and, and the social hostilities index. In other words, when you have a country that has full democracy operating, they perform much better um, than countries that just have peace, uh, peaceful, that are just peaceful or also have um, government restrictions and also have social hostilities. In other words, the, the democracy of a country shapes the way in which that country will also be more peaceful or not. There appears to be a link between regime type and atheism. You can see here about the countries which have what we call more authoritarian regimes and not so authoritarian. Um, we call some hybrid regimes where you might have a more more or less authoritarianism in the in the in the um, in the country in the government. That can also influence the level of authoritarianism in 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 the country. Can also influence and this in this particular case there is a link with uh, the countries where there is an, uh, high numbers of atheists with a country. Um, level of um, authoritarianism or not. So this is a, another important statement to look at this uh, this result. I'm I'm having to go quite fast because unfortunately we can't go and explain all of the report. And I wanted to focus on these five questions, so I'm having to go through the re the report quite quickly. So organisations and community group memberships rates above average are associated with high levels of peacefulness. In other words here, organizations and community groups that they don't have to be religious, they can be anything. They could be arts groups, they can be grandmothers groups, they can be disabled groups. They tend, more of these groups tend to result in more peacefulness in a country. In other words, um, it's not necessarily has to be religious or um, you know, specific professional groups. It's this combination of having more what we call, what we would call probably more diverse and more inclusive groups, which is a really good point to show about the importance of inclusivity and leaving no one behind because you will have more levels of peacefulness the more you include more people from different diverse backgrounds. Now, an important one here, which I'd like to end with that one, about the potential for peace building. We found in our report that religion has huge potential to play and a positive role in peace building and very much through interfaith dialogue and other religiously motivated movements. Also, religion can be a catalyst 
for bringing about peace through ending conflicts, as well as helping to build strong social cohesion. I'm very much, uh, I think this is a very, very important part, I think, of the report that IEP wants to show that there is huge potential for us to see the positive force that religion can have to building peace. And I think I'd like to end with that. Just some last words to say that um, for my experience, um, I have worked for many years in many conflict zones. Um, been doing for 20 more more than 20 years. Uh, and of course, in all these conflicts, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, in Afghanistan, in Rwanda, in Sudan, in the Thai Burma border, in Kosovo, all of these countries. I learned one thing from the refugees and the displaced people. They all wanted one thing. It was the same thing everywhere, and it was peace. And that's why after working in this field, I wanted to go back and learn more about what actually this word peace means. And I went back to work at the, the university and to be able now to see now how peace now is so integral to the work that we do in the humanitarian field and development and in so many other sectors. And I think what's important is that we learn, well, I've learned more from this concept of peace that we have more that connects us than divides us. And this is an important part of peace that we are doing this. And I hope that we can show maybe from today, from some of your examples of how we can do this. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Now to give some insight into the Jewish perspective, I'd like to welcome Rabbi Jeffrey Kamens. Rabbi Jeffrey Kamens OAM has served as Senior Rabbi of the Emmanuel Synagogue since 1999. He founded Australia's first Masorti service, advocates for egalitarianism, and officiated Australia's first same-sex religious marriage. He's deeply involved in social justice, environmental issues, and animal rights advocacy. Welcome, Rabbi Jeffrey Kamen. Thank you, Jessica, and uh, also, of course, uh, Weiss and uh, Tricia for your paper, which I did read, and uh, I also saw so follow everyone and acknowledge uh, that uh, we are on the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, but I also want to acknowledge that there was a generous invitation from all First Nations to walk with them uh, into a better future for all Australians back with the Uluru Statement of the Heart in May 2017. And I want to acknowledge as well that we still need to listen to their voice in our country and learn the truth of our intertwined history. And so we can then enter treaties to share equitably the bounty of this land. So uh, I hope we can all accept that very generous invitation. I want to um, note uh, one thing, if I read correctly, Patricia, that the paper that you did covered more the last 100 years, um, a period that I would call, you know, post-enlightenment modernity, the growth of secularism, atheism, and those kinds of things. But at the same time, it's been a century with rising economic inequality, environmental crises causing more vulnerability, and refugee movement. And of course, these are major drivers for conflict, and they will remain so. But as long as fundamentalism drives religion, it remains more of a threat to than a promise for humanity. And I think the longer perspective of a couple of millennia since the predominance of monotheism gives us a different and perhaps better perspective on the issue of religion and peace. And obviously I know that wasn't your research paper, but I wanna delve into that. And so I have to acknowledge I cannot comment much on the pre-monotheistic, now what we call pagan world, in terms of this question. 
But my, and although my assumption is that in that era, one would not speak uh, extensively of conflict as being religiously motivated. Um, my understanding really is that those religious conflicts began with the rise of monotheism and its concomitant authoritarian model. Now, as a Jew, I acknowledge that the first monotheistic faith was Judaism, and therefore we have something for which to repent. And uh, in terms of introducing religious war into human consciousness. Although I hope my faith partners will acknowledge that that concept of religious war um, spread easily and rapidly to the successor re religious doctrines of Christianity and Islam. I have taken out the whole section of that this paper um, to time constraints, but of course, you know, one of the things is Constantine's um, you know vision uh, of the cross, and by this you shall conquer that eventually unfolded into other kinds of things, not that that necessarily meant what has unfolded in Christianity. And of course, uh, in Islam as well, which um, like all faiths is a religion of peace. On the other hand, there are aspects within Islam that also call for uh, conflict on occasion. And so I'm not going to go into Christianity, Islam, that's not my bailiwick, but in the Ten Commandments, uh, we read the core principle of monothe monotheistic faiths, which is you shall have no other gods beside me. There is an authority God, um, and we in Judaism in the Torah, it says, and I, the Lord your God, an impassioned God, the word impassioned, a synonym for zealotry. In the story of the golden calf that soon follows thereafter, the first apostasy told of our people not long after we were freed from Egypt, we read of zealous action to defend God's supremacy over idols. Whoever is the Lord, come here, says Moses, and all the Levites rallied to him, and he said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, each of you put sword on thigh, go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay brother, neighbor, and kin. Ancient Israelites, later known as Jews, are a nation commanded in the Bible to fight war to main control, maintain control over their land. And there are other stories of conflict and war seemingly justified in God's name, I think, in just about every scripture. So the crucial issue here for me is that there are those who believe that these stories really are God's will and God's command. And in every religion, there are adherents who believe their scripture is the literal word of God. And therefore, there are then those religious leaders who believe that they have the exclusive right to interpret and enforce those teachings, and often they end up being chauvinistic and triumphalistic. Now, not all teachings of any scripture are drivers of conflict, violence, and othering. But as long as there are some teachings like that, and they are seen as the literal word of God, there remains the potential within religion for heightened conflict and war. Now, certainly our Torah, the entire Bible, and all scripture contains far more teachings that are beautiful and inspiring, a few of which I will mention shortly. And there are many religious adherents and leaders who understand that we have to choose how to interpret each story found in our tradition, not only as the literal word of God, perhaps, as well of human striving to aspire to that which we call God. Judaism, which is the faith practice of our people for Jews, are also an ancient people with land and culture and language and all that. From biblical times through the rabbinic period, and into this moment in time, has countless teachings about pursuing peace, implementing justice with equity, practicing loving kindness and compassion, and the preeminence of love itself and acting with humility are forefront. Judaism is a major religion with nonviolence and peace as part of its religious traditions, even though that wasn't mentioned in the executive summary uh, for that. So what, the next version, if it could be added in, that would be lovely. Um, and so um, I just want to give a few. Our foundational story uh, 
kind of, which is centered on the experience of being slaves oppressed in Egypt, commands us uh, many, many things. Among them, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the soul of the stranger, having yourselves been stranger in the land of Egypt. And also you shall love the stranger as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. These are just two of the many examples of peaceful protection and compassionate embrace of the other found in our Torah and emphasized in later teachings. And then the prophets themselves base uh, their teachings on this idea. And everybody, I think, knows the famous words of Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not take up sword against a nation, nor shall they ever again know war. And that vision is then amplified by a teaching in the book of Proverbs that really gives us a lens about how we are meant to interpret and teach our tradition. As it says of the Torah, its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Not always, and that's why we are called to read them with that lens. Thousands of years of subsequent rabbinic tradition written, I have to say, in a time of powerlessness, emphasizes the concepts of the preeminence of peace and justice, love and compassion. I believe all religious scripture has this conundrum. Some of its texts permit, encourage, or condone hostility and even violence toward the other, even if most of their texts are some supporting peaceful coexistence and mutual support. So as, which, uh, to, as to which of these texts takes precedence in any religious system depends on whether the religious authority understands all these uh, texts as intentions towards God or direct proclamations from God for which they have the exclusive and absolute power of interpretation. We have to acknowledge that still to this day there are plenty of powerful and influential men, and I use that word consciously, who wield that power and influence, who believe God sanctions their use of violence as a means to obtain religious goals. So I do not want to let religion off the hook so easily. Even if we recognize that many of the worst conflicts and wars since the Enlightenment, when religious authority began to crumble, have been driven by secular nations, and particularly in this last century, among them Communist Russia, Nazi Germany, and Maoist China. But these states merely substituted the chauvinistic, triumphalistic, and patriarchal authority of a religious leader with an autocratic leader of the state. So, we have been asked, what is it about religion that enables it in some circumstances to be harnessed as a fuel for aggression? And for me, the answer resides in who has the power to apply and interpret the religious system? Most religions ascribe ultimate power to God. A wonderful contemporary Jewish educator, Abraham Infeld, has said that the genius of monotheism's teaching that there is only one almighty God is to let every human being know that the job has already been taken. Alas, that call to, humanity, to humility can be lacking in many religious authorities, and secular ones as well, of course. But as for those religious authorities, once they ascribe God's voice as being literally recorded in Scripture and insist on their exclusive ability to interpret and apply that voice, in all circumstances, we have entered into dangerous fundamentalist territory. And when that religious authority assumes state power, I believe re religious conflicts will turn into religious wars. So the best way to avoid religions being harnessed as fuel for aggression is to break that power of fundamentalist authority, but that is not easy, because who wants to give up power? When religious and state authority are decoupled, as we have seen in recent history, religious authority's power diminishes and a more accommodating, peace-seeking, faith-based way of life becomes more possible. Now, this decoupling began in the 17th century with Spinoza, the Jewish philosopher who, for me, rightly noted that all religious systems were based in a firm belief in something for which there was no proof. 
With the subsequent enlightenment and the rise of scientific inquiry, more people recognized for them the speciousness of religious claims that God communicated this absolute truth once and for all to this or that person or this or that group. Now, secular society arose, but in a sense, throughout the baby with the bathwater. Its rightful rejection of autocratic religious authority led to an equal rejection and loss of faith. Today, reactionary fundamentalist forces in religion whose systems are based on beliefs, the essence of beliefs is something for which there is no proof, at times either force their religious systems on other well-meaning humans who do not hold those beliefs, or attack others with different beliefs. A religious system is developed from a faith that humbly re recognizes it is precisely just faith, an assumption for which there is no proof. There is, with that, the potential to contribute to the improvement of the human condition. And so we are asked, do we really understand the relationship of faith and religion with conflict and war? But I think, and also, what can we do to avoid religions being harnessed as fuel for aggression? But I think there's this prior question that helps us answer those questions. What is the relationship of faith and religion? Faith is confidence, reliance, or belief, especially without evidence or proof. But religion is more than that. It's the system it's more than a synonym for faith. It is the system developed from faith. So the best way to avoid religions being harnessed as fuel for aggression is to acknowledge that all religions are based in a faith for which there is no proof. Humbly acknowledging that religious systems are faith-based human constructs, we first take responsibility for our faith and then how we use those religious systems to enhance the cause of peace tolerance, and inclusion. When we acknowledge that faith is just an assumption, a choice to live one's life as if, we have the ability to create non-fundamentalist religious systems that are non-coercive and more accepting, acknowledging that no one has exclusive truth, but each one has unique dignity. My faith, born from Judaism, teaches me that there is one indivisible, universal life force, the common term for that is God, that interconnects all living beings. I choose to live my life as if that were so, but I acknowledge I will never be able to prove it or know it before the moment of my death, whether it's so or not. My faith guides me to fashion a religious system. My Judaism is one of empowerment, not power over, one in which each of us is called to sing in this life uh, with awareness to, of, and responsibility for the consequences of all we say and all we do. And from my faith's first stories, I learned the sacredness of all life, the obligations of humans to look after this planet and all sentient creatures upon it, and to look after each other as well. We have the challenge of knowing the difference between good and bad, and peaceful coexistence and violent destruction. We are each other's keeper, and the invitation of faith is to live as if all life is one and sacred, and thereby make that evident in a world of peace. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Now to hear from the Christian perspective, I'd like to welcome Sosiana Joyce Tangi. Sosiana Joyce Tangi is a second generation Tongan Australian pastor in the New South Wales ACT Synod of the Uniting Church and supports intergenerational ministry in multicultural contexts. She engages in ecumenical and interfaith dialogue and mentors young migrants and advocates for social justice. Joyce co-leads the Pacific Australian Emerging Leaders Summit. So welcome, Siosiana Joyce Tangi. Malolele and good afternoon. It's nice to see you all here this afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to be here with all of you. I too firstly pay my respects to elders, 
um, and first peoples of this land and all God's creation amongst it. I find great joy and passion in interfaith dialogue and have grown strong, and he has grown strong within me for the last seven years. But it's moments and spaces like this, it really shows how tight knit and important these gatherings are to grow and have harmony as we all share. I know as a young person, as I engage in settings like this, it's an understanding to continue to be an advocate for unity and to hold strong and be perfect and be a prophetic voice in today's world for a better way. Today I share a Christian faith perspective of how religion brings inner peace to many people, but also asking how do we really understand the relationship of faith and religion with conflict and war. I want to say up front that I am in no means an expert in this space, but it is through these events of interfaith dialogue that I truly understand what it means to stand in solidarity and to listen to hearts of felt stories of not only my own, but to know that it holds importance of my brothers and sisters. And I want uh, want you all to know that in these spaces, we can bring hope and light to whatever we want to share together. So the relationship between faith, religion, conflict and peace is complex, especially when considering the Christian faith. Christianity, like most religions, promote ideals of peace, love and justice. But throughout history, it has also been involved in conflicts. To understand how Christian faith can help bring peace to this world, it's important to explore both the challenges and the opportunity within its relationships. War and peace are insepar inseparably tied together when it comes to this discussion. Throughout centuries, people have been trying to develop the concept of war, analyze the cause of it and, necess and its necessary means to bring peace or what conditions are necessary for peace. So for some real talk, throughout history, we know that there are historical tensions between faith and conflict. Oops. Sorry. Christianity has been involved in such wars, misuse of religious teachings, such as crusades and religious wars in Europe, where political power and territorial control were often the true motivators, even through faith have been used to justify violence. Christian denominations have sometimes been in conflict with one another, seen as violence, for example, in the in Northern Ireland, where religious divisions can become entrenched when they are tied in national, ethnic, and political identities. The just war theory, where some Christian teachings have been used to justify war under certain circumstances, suggesting that violence can be morally permissible to achieve justice. While these theories aim to regulate war's conduct, it has been criticized for potentially uh, legalizing violence. War and peace are subject to moral, theological, and political construction. In ancient times, for example, Greek thinkers were, and conquerors were more territorial. These have come out through historians. Likewise, as the philosopher, philosopher Plato understands, war as the realm of human activity, but he was more concerned how it creates peace than specifically talking about the origin of war. However, Plato clearly says that every city is in a natural state of war with each other. Therefore, if war is pursued, the guardians of the state are in one's particular exclusively conduct of the war. We also hear of how war is rooted in human appetite for power, 
to pursue political ambitions and to have an understanding and view that we can hold what people don't know. In addition to all of this, from the Middle Ages to the mod into modern times, many thinkers, particularly Christians, have also talked about war in terms of ethical norm, that is right or wrong. War has attracted attentions among Christians, both Catholic and Protestant. Much debate to longstanding discussions have also taken since the early Christian period on the issue of attaining last, lasting peace and proper attitude on which Christians should take, a should take a stand in regard to war. In searching for the correct path, Christians point to the example of Jesus's life, biblical passages, historical records, and teachings of the church, of church fathers. So what does Christian perspective on, so what is our Christian perspective on peace? In my own context long ago, English missionaries had come to the Blue Pacific proclaiming that they, the Tongans in my perspective, were wrong in their worship, traditions, gained power. Now years and centuries later, Many, not only the Blue Pacific, are decolonizing their ways of how they have been powered and wrongfully used by biblical teachings. Despite its historical associations with conflict, Christianity's foundational teachings emphasize peace, love, and reconciliation. And these values can be key to promoting global peace. Peace is both used in my context, both negatively and positively. However, emphasized Christian views and peace is always connected with love and justice, and it includes an inner and spiritual dimension. Love is understood as attitudes and actions. It comes from the, word, the Greek word agape, to mean love and to charity. Equally, Christians hold views that there is no peace where there is no justice, and there is no justice where human persons do not have their basic human rights. It is therefore all social systems based on peace and justice must be built on the concept of the human person and human rights. Many scholars have argued that Christians derive their concept of peace from teachings of Jesus. The genesis of Christian concept is acknowledged by Weber and Galton, spiritual and religious leaders from the Buddha, from Buddha and Jesus to Gandhi and the Dalai Lama have been inclined to adequate peace and love, both the inner dimensions and the manner in which people who are spiritually developed interact with others. Love and justice are the foundations of peace in Christianity and also have been extensively impounded by Christian leaders in their writings, in their statements, and in their pastoral letters, through speeches and sermons. A Christian leader, Pope Paul VI, in his message for World Days of Peace, he says, nor can no nor can one right, rightly speak on peace where no recognition nor respect is given to its solid foundations, namely sincerely justice and love. It is for the protection of these values that we place them beneath the banner of peace. Similarly, Desmond Tutu, a church leader from Africa, in 1984 said that there is no peace because there is no justice. And there is no real peace and security until the first justice enjoyed by all inhabitants of a beautiful land. We do not know what peace is without justice. And we will be crying, peace, peace, there is no peace. Today, we find and root ourselves in the righteousness of Jesus Christ through his teachings in the Holy Bible. So it's spaces like this interfaith movement that we affirm Christ's love 
and his love reconciles us and restores humankind from its ignorance, stereotype, discrimination, and violence. It's through the teachings of Jesus we found through the Holy Bible that is rooted in nonviolence, a message of love for one's neighbor and forgiveness. We hear his Sermon on the Mount in uh, the Holy Gospel of Matthew, which encourages us to be followers of peacemakers and also to love one another, especially our enemies. Christianity teaches the importance of forgiveness even in the face of wrongdoings. Jesus exemplified on the cross when he forgave those who crucified him. The spirit of forgiveness can heal deep division and foster reconciliation between individuals and nations. Within this space, we find dignity and compassion. The Christian belief is to inherit worth of every human being created in the image of God. It supports justice and compassion for all. This is the basis for all advocacy for peace and justice especially when fighting the war for the marginalized and oppressed. So how do we move forward in all of this? And what are we going to do about it? Promote, promoting nonviolence and justice. For Christians, it is grounded in its core values. We can be inspired by communities and individuals as they work for justice and nonviolence. Christians like Martin Luther King, Desmond Tutu, and Dorothy Day, who led a civil rights movement on equality, shows that faith can be a force of positive and social change. As Christians, the one number one value is to love your neighbor as yourself. It can also lead to active engagement in social justice, addressing the root cause of conflict which comes from poverty and inequality and discrimination. It also comes from social justice can prevent conflict by promoting fairness and opportunity for all. It is inspired by the teachings of Jesus that many Christian movements have embraced nonviolent resistance and oppressed of injustice. Showing that force and violence is not necessarily the achievement to get to justice. We are told that forgiveness, mercy, and grace is vital in healing wounds of conflict. After war or violence, Christian communities can play important roles by reconciliation, helping to mend, building relationships and trust. When we share our faith with inter uh, interfaith dialogue, when practiced with humility and openness, we can all contribute to peace through our interfaith dialogue. By working with one another in religious communities, Christians can help build understanding and cooperation between different groups, reducing tensions and fostering peace. When we collaborate for peace, it continues to show that our faith can be unifying force rather than a decisive one. Christian faith is, a, is the transformingness of our hearts and our minds. When individuals experience inner peace through their faith, they are more likely to contribute to peace in their communities. Spiritual practices such as prayer, meditation, and reflection can cultivate compassion, patience, and desire for justice. As prayer is essential to Christian practice, serves as a powerful tool for peace, as many does. These practical ways can help promote our global peace, such as advocating for nonviolence. By rejecting violence, it means resolving disputes and upholding the teachings of Jesus Christ. Supporting refugees and victims of conflict humanitarian aid to those affected in war, offering shelter, medical care, food. These acts of compassion offers peace. So in Christian faith, when lived out in its true essence, 
has the potential to bring peace. Through its teachings on love and forgiveness, justice and reconciliation, Christianity offers a powerful framework for addressing the root causes of conflict and healing divisions. By focusing on non-violence, advocating for justice and working in solidarity with others, Christian faith can be an agent for peace in a world that desperately needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. We will now take these wonderful insights into a short break of five minutes. Please be back in your seats or be back online just before five past five. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> So you've got a favorite? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've got a 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 so we're going to have uh, some students from there of the topics because I have lots of all the video. We can have the video by one more and all that. But that doesn't sound really good for the public to see. I'm <laughs> 
All right, everyone, if I could have your attention. I don't think it's on. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Welcome back from our very short break. Uh, look, before we um, ha have our next speaker up to the microphone, we're just going to get a, a quick photo of the people in the room. So if you don't mind, <laughs> you could all face the front, please. All right. Wonderful, thank you very much. So now I would like to welcome Zia Ahmad to give insight from the Islamic perspective. Zia Ahmad is Editor-in-Chief of the Australasian Muslim Times, the Muslim online news and monthly print newspaper, and trustee of the Islamic Foundation for Education and Welfare and the Australian Multicultural Eid Festival and Fair Consortium. He has won multiple awards, including the Premier's Multicultural Communications Award in 2019 and 2021. He's a retired biochemist with over 40 years at the University of Sydney, and he actively promotes multiculturalism and interfaith dialogue. Welcome, Zia Ahmad. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin with the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. And I greet you all with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. As we gather here on this land in peace, we pay our respects to elders past and present and to all Aboriginal members of our community. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this land was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. 
Now let me start this noble gathering with the Islamic prayer of peace that I will recite in Arabic and then render it in English. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa ilayka yarju salam wa hayyana rabbana bis salam wa dhkhilna dar salam tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayta ya dhal jalal wal ikram. O oh Allah, you are peace, and peace comes from you, and we seek peace from you. Keep us alive, our Lord, with peace, and make us to enter the abode of peace. Blessed are you, O oh possessor of majesty and honor. Amen. As we celebrate the United Nations Invitational Day of Peace today, I wish to thank the Institute for Economics and Peace, the Raising Peace Festival, and Rick Australia to say a few words on faith, religion, and peace today. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, let me admit that I'm no scholar of religion, unlike our rabbi here but an activist working for peace and harmony. Motivated by my Islamic traditions, my Indian cultural heritage, and living in this great multicultural Australia for more than half a century that has enriched me very much. So I'll be expressing my own views based on my limited knowledge and experience from an Islamic perspective on faith, religion, and peace. Faith or Iman in Arabic means belief in one God. And as our rabbi has uh, already uh, mentioned, that faith cannot be proved. And that's what is called faith in one God. And faith or Iman means in one God and trust in Him, while religion or deen in Arabic means practicing the way of life in accordance with his, his guardians, faith and religion. Coming back to Islam, unlike other religions who are named after their founders, the word Islam is derived from the word Salam, which means itself peace, a name of God himself. As I recited in the prayer, Salam is one of the characteristics of God. A follower of Islam or Muslim is therefore a person who submits to the will of God through following his commandments and therefore attains peace. The Holy Scripture of Islam, the Quran, and the practices and sayings of Prophet Muhammad, known as Hadith, is in a nutshell, teach Muslims to live in peace with their families, neighbors, and the environment, avoiding conflict in a just and equitable manner. Quran values the life by declaring clearly, and I quote, Whoever slays a soul, it is as though he slew all men. And whoever keeps it alive, it is as though he kept alive all men. Historically, throughout his life, Prophet Muhammad avoided conflicts, but was confronted in defensive wars imposed by the non Muslims in order to decimate the nascent Muslim community. In fact, if you read the history of uh, or life history of uh, Prophet Muhammad, at one stage, he signed a peace treaty with his old enemies of Mecca, the pagans of Mecca, with unfavorable conditions for the nascent Muslim community in Medina in order to avoid ongoing conflict and bloodshed. 
Now, history of the world is written in a negative way. When, when we read history, this basically means the history of wars. You know, crusades, World War I, World War II. These are the, the milestones we read. So history is basically a narrative of conflicts, what negative happened. And that's one of the weakness of the history. That we, uh, we, the history of war and conflicts without mentioning the long periods of peace and harmony in a positive way. And Muslim history is the same. So when we look at history, we find throughout the world, wars, 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 wars. But in between, there were peaceful times. People lived in harmony as well. And I think we need to appreciate that as well, that there were peace for long periods uh, in between these historical milestones. However, it must be pointed out that wars and conflicts were overwhelmingly not based on religions or religious motivation, but for land, wealth, power, and they were waged on people of different religions as well as on core religionists. So from Muslim history, we can take two examples. The two large empires, Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire, who engaged in conquest by equally waging wars against non-Muslims as well as fully Muslim compatriots. So when we think about Ottoman empires, we think in terms of Ottoman, Turk, Muslims waging war with the Christian Europeans. Okay. On that hand, and also we talk about Mughals. Who, held, uh, who held a uh, big empire in Indian subcontinent. And the story from some uh, comes that the Mughals were fighting the Hindus in India. But when you look into a little bit deeper there, you find that these emperors or the rulers, they were not only fighting people of different, uh, of opposed other religions, they were fighting other competitors in those lands as well. So the idea that uh, the Mughals or the, uh, the Turks, they were champions of Islam, they were fighting a holy war against non-believers, that's completely absurd. And same thing goes in Europe. When you look at the details of wars between Ottomans and Christian Europe, you'll find there were alliances. Sometimes a Christian king will have alliance with the Ottoman Turk and they are fighting the other Christian kings within Europe. And same thing happened in terms of uh, Ottomans fighting the Persians on the other side, having alliance with the Christians. And same thing happened also in India. I come from India. And you'll find that there were wars between Mughals and other sultans in the south of India. And they were Muslims. Another thing which was very funny to me that one of the um, uh, one of the sorry I'm just looking at the time um, one of the emperors Aurangzeb Alamgir he was fighting the Sultan of Hyderabad and his commander in chief was actually a Hindu while uh, his another part of his army was fighting uh, the uh, Marathas which are Hindus. And the commander in chief was a Muslim. So you can see that although the, the, the public things that they were religious wars and they were, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, these wars were waged in the name of religion, but they were, this is actually a deception. So what these conquerors uh, did, what they did use the sentiment, the religious sentiment in order to wage those wars for their own vested interest. Not, they were not faithful people who were actually doing anything for the sake of faith. Um, so of course the religion was used by all these conquerors aggressively, rally their troops for their ambitions, for their own vested interests throughout history. This is indeed true with the Crusades as well. In modern times, 
Again, religion has been used as a battle cry to serve the interests of the powerful. But at the same time, religion has also been used to resist oppression and achieve freedom. We have religious movements who have rallied in order to achieve uh, 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 freedom and to counter oppression. Now, um, as, uh, 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 as people of faith and practitioners of religion, it is important for us to appeal to the positive spirit of, uh, of religion in particular, as well as that of Islam to avoid conflicts and build a peaceful world. And here I just want to commend um, my Christian colleague here who gave us some details about how, as people of faith, we can be an instrument in terms of world peace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zia. Now I would like to welcome our very own Rigpa teacher and longtime student of the Buddhist teachings, Marianne Gazicki. Marianne Gazicki joined Rigpa in 1994 and has since studied under several renowned Buddhist teachers. She teaches meditation and, at, and Buddhist philosophy at Rigpa Sydney and has worked with business leaders and women in recovery from substance use. She's served as Rigpa Australia's National Director of Teaching Services for 10 years. So welcome, Marianne Gazicki. And again, like the previous speakers, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Gadigal land and to honour the great peacemaking traditions um, of our Indigenous forefathers. From a Buddhist perspective, there are three things that transform whatever we do from a mundane activity into something spiritual. We call these the three noble principles. Good in the beginning is to reflect on our motivation for our action. Good in the middle is to maintain an attitude of non-grasping. Good in the end is to offer up whatever good we have achieved. Let's see how these three can contribute to peacemaking and whether they shed any light on why religion is misused in conflict. So good in the beginning. Each day we start with this short prayer. By the power and the truth of this practice, may all sentient beings enjoy happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the great happiness devoid of suffering. May they dwell in the great equanimity that is free from attachment and aversion. We do this because just like me, each and every one wants to be happy and at ease. Every single person, every single being, wants to feel safe, just like me. They want to be valued and loved, just like me. They want to be well and comfortable in their own skin, just like me. And if we look a little more closely, we'll see that there are two kinds of happiness. One is based on physical comfort, the chair that you're sitting on, the temperature in this room, the fit of our clothes the whole array of outer circumstances. The other type of happiness is based on a deeper mental contentment, which allows us to be satisfied and content even amidst the most difficult circumstances. This deeper unconditional contentment is treasured and fostered by all religious traditions. Muhammad said, wealth is not having many possessions, but rather true wealth is feeling sufficiency in the soul. As a Buddhist, this insight leads us to conclude that what we need to work with most is our own mind. This takes us down the path of meditation and contemplation to tame and train our own mind. To simply sit and rest our mind on the flow of our breath 
is actually a radically peaceful act. But it's not enough just to sit and watch our breath. Also vital to the Buddhist path is cultivating actions that are conducive to peace of mind and acting compassionately is key to this. And it's a key part of who we truly are. Our innate capacity for empathy is the most precious of all human qualities, but we're also balancing that with a sense of our self-interest. In some ways, there's nothing inherently wrong with pursuing one's own interests. In fact, it's because we care for our own needs that we have a natural capacity to appreciate others' kindness and love. This instinct for self-interest becomes negative when we are ex excessively self-focused. The trick is, from a Buddhist perspective, the best way to look after our own self-interest is to consider the welfare of others. And this is because we are deeply connected. We interbe. Take a moment just to think of the thousands of people who have been involved in you being here today. You can think of the people you're close to, your family, your friends, your colleagues, but also the thousands of people that you will never meet, the people who grew your food, who sewed your clothes, the people that built this building, and the hundreds and thousands of people that are involved in everything that we do in our daily life. The list goes on and on and on, and it's actually infinite. So how do we grow our ability to act with compassion to become more effective peacemakers? The Buddha's path lays out a series of contemplations that help us stretch our sense of self-identity to bring us closer to others. Earlier, I repeated the phrase, just like me. The first step is equalising ourselves with others really deeply reflecting how, at our core, we are all the same. This then inspires loving-kindness practice. We start with someone who's easy to love, like a pet or a child or a parent. We bring them strongly to mind and then we silently send love and care their way and we repeat some simple phrases, may you be happy, May you be safe, may you be healthy, may you live with ease. Or we essentialise this in may you be happy, may you be well. Then we extend this to someone more neutral. Might be someone in this room who you've never met before, someone you saw on the bus or at the supermarket. May you be happy, may you be well. Then once you've found some confidence with that, you can try moving on to a difficult person, even those who we have the most difficulty with, who may have committed the most hateful crimes. We have a deep understanding that if they were truly happy and content and actually considered the true implications of their actions, they would never do hurtful things. May you be happy, may you be well. And then in the limit, we extend that loving kindness to beings everywhere. May you be happy, may you be well. The next step is to exchange ourselves and others. We practice mentally offering all our happiness, well-being, and good fortune to others and visualise ourselves, visualize ourselves taking on the suffering, misery and lack of others. And if we're really up for it, we can go even further and consider others as more important than ourselves. In the first place, there's many more others than me. So why do these practices work? First, because at our core, we are fundamentally compassionate, empathetic beings. And I'm conscious that I'm here on home turf and we're sitting here with a large Buddha statue behind us. This statue is not here so much as an object of worship, but as a reminder that our own true nature is exactly the same as the Buddha's. 
This statue is a mirror reminding us that we all have within us capacity for vast, limitless compassion. That potential for enlightenment, which in our tradition we call Buddha nature, can be likened to the sun. And the sun brings with it two wonderful life-giving qualities, warmth and light. Its warmth is like love and compassion. Its brilliant light is wisdom. When we purify our heart, it becomes love and compassion. When we purify our thoughts, when we purify our mind, that pure intelligence, unobscured by ignorance, is wisdom. And this brings us to the second noble principle, good in the middle. And this is the frame of mind which we bring to any activity. We describe that as the attitude of non-grasping, which sounds a bit clinical but could not be further from the truth. The Buddha compared the universe to a vast net woven of a countless variety of brilliant jewels, each with a countless number of facets. Each jewel reflects it in itself with every other jewel in the net. So another beautiful image to show how completely interconnected we are with the world at large. But also this vast web of interdependencenesses is constantly changing. It only takes one element in the web to change for everything to be set in motion. It's not static. Light is always moving through the net. And in a similar way, modern physics shows us that we ourselves are really just a flow of energy rather than a solid concrete thing. Nothing has any concrete self-contained existence on its own. It's all completely interdependent and impermanent. When we really look at ourselves and the things around us that we constantly take to be solid, stable and lasting, we find they're not so concrete. From a Buddhist perspective, we see the futility of grasping. Everything just slips through our fingers. This is not giving up. It's not nihilism. It's not not caring. It's quite the reverse. Because when you stop trying to nail everything down, you can approach the world with much more health, healthy openness. Some of this might seem like the bleeding obvious. Of course, things change. Of course, we're inter interdependent. The big question is why we fail to act on this understanding at a micro level in our day-to-day -day actions and at a broader social level. And this might go some way to explaining why religion, including Buddhism, gets misused and becomes a fuel for war and aggression. The Buddhist answer is to look at our habits. Try as we might to be peaceful and loving, we are battling against the small-minded habits of attachment and aversion and ignorance that we fall into lifetime after lifetime. And these habits are built on two forms of ignorance. First is an emotional type of obscuration where we have this tendency to cling to ourselves. And that feeds anger, jealousy, pride, greed, and indifference. We fall into the mistake of seeing the world from a self-centered point of view. And then there's a more cognitive form of ignorance, which is a technical way of, seeing, of saying we missee the world around us. We get surprised when a cup breaks. We get angry when our assumptions about how our day was, should go fall short. We feel grief when our loved ones die. It's these two forms of ignorance that are, are at play whenever someone intentionally harms another. So this is at the individual personal level. At an institutional level, when on the spiritual path, community is vital. In Buddhist thinking, a community of practitioners sits at the same level as the Buddha and the Buddha's teachings. But sadly, there's a difference between being a community of pure practitioners and an institution made up of flawed individuals who fall for the self-centered traps of what one Buddhist teacher has termed spiritual materialism. 
So let's take the impact of the distortion of religious truths that come from religious-based conflict as inspiration to return to these three noble principles and finally come to good in the end. Interdependence and impermanence mean that what we do really matters because our actions can have far-reaching effects. Because our thoughts dictate our actions, there is power in mentally offering whatever good we have fostered. And this is the third noble principle, offering up or dedicating whatever good we have generated. We think of the great peacemakers of the past, the Jewish prophets, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, the Buddha, all the saints, scholars and practitioners who have lived lives of peace. And we think that we are following in their footsteps and we take that inspiration and we wish that there may be peace in the world so that everyone may be entirely free of want and illness and that they may experience deep, long-lasting well-being and happiness. We can think of the positivity and goodness of this dialogue today and offer it up so that it may contribute to the growth of compassion in this city, in this country and in our world. And we offer it to all those who are now living embodiments of compassion all around the world, in every culture, in every religion, in every place. May they live long, may their aspirations bear fruit. And we can dedicate so that living beings of all kinds will all move to greater and greater happiness and are freed from every kind of suffering. And we take a moment to think as widely and universally as possible. And then we take a moment to imagine that this has actually happened. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, so now we're going to set up the room for a panel discussion. So I invite our speakers to um, come to the front of the room. So this is an opportunity for you all to ask questions. There's going to be a roving mic in the audience. Um, so put your hand up if you have a question to ask. Uh, for the people online, uh, please put your questions in the chat box and they will be asked on your behalf. So thank you. Our facilitator for our panel discussion will be Rigpa teacher Elizabeth Please. So our time is short. Our time is short. We have until um, just on six o'clock. So I'm going to invite anyone who has questions that will respond online and general um, if you could put your question in the chat and Jane will pass it on or someone in the room and just the usual thing. Can you please make it a question and not an extended comment? <laughs> and please address it to someone in particular on the panel. Jane, I'm not. Yeah. We have a great question from our viewers. Um, so, Patricia, anyway, so this is the question from Patricia. When judging the level of peacefulness of the country, does the IE group work on the use of that country or could it spoil? Or are there any others that are going to go? So, if there's a plan, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, uh, yes, uh, the Global Peace Index, which uh, measures the absence of violence or the fear of violence, which IP calls negative peace, um, 
looks at three domains, and we have about 23 indicators under each of these three domains that actually, when they're put together, gives the score of each country in terms of their level of peacefulness. And those three domains are militarization. The second one is international and domestic conflict. And the third domain is safety and security. So if you look at the militarization domain, we have a set of measures, indicators, to be able to measure the militarization of each country. And we do use um, one measure is the amount of expenditure that each country spends on weapons. So that is one very key indicator and exactly what you're saying. So that is one of the measures we do use to be able to rank the peacefulness of a country. Yeah. Um, I want to mention in Australia in particular, we were um, 2022, I think, we went right down to 27th position, which was a big jump down. And the reason why that peacefulness of Australia deteriorated, um, one of the factors was the increase in expenditure of Australian government on weapons, importing and exporting. So it contributed to a drop in our peacefulness. So there was obviously the other factor was in the safety and security um, dimension, which was our very high incarceration rate of particularly of uh, youth. So you can see here how these domains all when combined together is what we use to score the peacefulness of countries. Thank you, Patricia. Um, anyone else in the room or on the line? Thank you. Uh, I will make the best question to Rabbi Cummins. Uh, I'm currently reading a fascinating book, which I recommend to everybody, uh, called The Soul and the History of the Human Mind by Paul Hingham, who's a historian. It's a 300,000 year history of the idea of the soul. Uh, and following from that, I'd like to ask uh, your views on the differences between religious belief and spirituality and how that might play out. We today have the benefits of neuroscience and research on the brain in terms of both emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. So just be interested in your views on this. Thank you. Thank you. I think it my answer played with this and to a certain extent of the child and um and maybe I've had a choice to get a very quick background that uh, you know most ethical person and my moral guidance my father may as never be for a lesson and he was also an atheist. So I never believed in my own personal life or my you know spiritual practice that um one needs to have spiritual practice to be a good, moral, ethical human being. Um, at the same time, for whatever reason, I have always had this deeply spiritual sense of connectedness um, that eventually over time developed into how I'm just going to change from here. So I know that I'm from a secular scientific background, and I just acknowledge that. And I guess for me, um, all these things may just be those things are which you know, can be in my mind. And at the same time, I just had a success that there was something ethereal and ultimately beyond. So I was about to say that it has to be a big And then I just want to add, you know, if you're a speaker or something, you know, it was a response to the community. So I uh, read the spiritual reality, and then it's an autonomy of the five body, and it's the thing that we bring it, and it comes to the end of 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 the
As I said in my introduction, uh, Mr. Bain, I want to watch the division and, and politicians striving on creating divisions. Um, what is the role of faith and English, and how we as practitioners of faith, of different faiths, can stand up and contribute to a more harmonious society and in a way to call our politicians uh, to account. The UN start and council, the UN has a lot of good work, but when it comes to peace in the world, and uh, it has been crowded as well. So I wonder if you have any great advice and insights as to what our faith traditions can contribute. I know it starts with us and our own enemies, but after that, how do we yeah, promote the greater peace in our own society here in Australia, but also in you know, how that contributes to world peace? Okay. I'll say I'm not about it, but I do want to say that maybe something in the piece of zeal that I think is so true, we talk about history being written about conflicts and wars, and sadly, that's where the news reports are. I always say to people, you're not going to find on the news that a group of people gathered here like this. So, that, you know, there was kindness exhibited in the park over there when a little child fell. Those things don't make the news in the bigger complexity, of course, social media, for whatever reason, as um, those topic readers chose to um, follow the reptilian brain and develop algorithms that are based on historical newsworthy, hate filled, fear filled items. So I think what we need to do as faith leaders is, and I do this in my community, is to say to people, watch what you see, watch what you hear, and know how much you're actually creating the reality around you by choosing to put your emphasis over there. So that's one way I'm trying to do it. But uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, media. Uh, it's just the nature of the media is that if uh, a man invites a dog, that's big news. <laughs> now, dog fighting a man is no news. So, unfortunately, negative news sells. And here I want to remind you that uh, on the editor of Australasian Muslim Times, that we actually promote. Positive views and we have a few copies of the newspaper if you can pick up on your way up. And we actually, uh, the last uh, few years we have been operating, give news of this kind of gathering, the positive uh, aspects in our community, uh, what's happening uh, on a small scale, but we are making our effort, effort there. Um, so that's a good point to make that, that you know. Uh, if a man helps a lady cross the road, that never continues because that's positive. So uh, I think that's uh, important what we need to do. Um, the other thing I was saying, like Mr. Kulik was saying that uh, people of faith, uh, they have to look after refugees and provide aid and so forth and so on. Uh, that's really good. But I think we need to also, people of faith need to look into why are the refugees not coming from? Where are they from? Why not, instead of, for example, uh, you know, sending aid to conflicts in Syria or Palestine or, uh, uh, you know, in Bangladesh or whatever, we also need to look at why the conflicts were there. If we stop them from, from that, then we don't have to, you know, we, we can spend that money in education of our own children. <laughs> same thing with your best time. And for that, we need to, people of faith have to be political activists. We need to demand from our authorities and politicians that not only that we are going to look after refugees and, 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 and provide aid and give donations and all that, but we demand from them to somehow work and, 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 and appeal to their conscience how they can actually stop this injustice and this wars and conflicts in the world, rather than we they, they keep doing it and we keep after all these people. 
request we did say you know, at the end of the day every institution is a, a sum of the people within it so as a religious practice you know, i think it's incumbent upon all of us first of all to do our utmost to be a good example and then to have the courage again as i said to advocate and politicians are humans as well and to engage in those conversations with them um, to try and demonstrate the implications of their actions and to show that really clearly. Um, yeah, I concur with uh, my the panel, but I also want to um, say that there's so much power in uh, truth, um, sharing truth tellings of um, not only yourself, but to stand in solidarity with others and uh, sharing the stories of not only yourself, but to tell the truth of someone else can have so much more, have so much of a powerful impact to have courage to get outside of your comfort zone and do something that you're not used to, but to do for the better. Um, that brings hope, that brings humanity, and that brings, um, you know, you're not in it. that person or that community is not in it by the, for themselves. Um, they're not there by themselves, but they have people alongside them that they can journey with. Um, one more question there. Um, I would describe one unified peaceful spirit or energy. What do you think it would look like or feel like? Can you repeat the last? Sure. Um, what do you think it would look like or feel like? A one unified is soul, spirit, or energy. Easy. Clear Buddhist answer is the gold guy behind us. But it's a sense of extreme compassion. I mean, literally unbounded compassion and extraordinary clear seeing. It's like, well, what does that mean? It's So it's tapping into that internal space. I think it's covered, but also, yeah. And for me, the sense of love. Okay, so I think that is exactly the right place to end our session today. Perfect. Thank you, Joyce and um, Jessica. <laughs> Wrap up. Well, what an incredible afternoon that we've shared to today. And thank you, everyone, for joining in so enthusiastically. Um, please join me in thanking our inspirational guests and presenters again, Wies Sharinga, Patricia Garcia, Rabbi Jeffrey Kamens, Siosiana Joyce Tangi, Zia Ahmad, Marianne Gazicki, and Elizabeth Wies. So now we'd like to present a small token of our gratitude to our guests as a gesture of thanks and a token of peace. And thank you also to Rigpa's wonderful organising team who have volunteered to bring this event together so beautifully at our National Centre, also known as Temple on the Park. Now I invite you all to take a short moment just before we finish to reflect on whatever positive benefit that we've generated together today. And you might like to direct that benefit towards peace in the world. 
And we hope that you'll continue to develop your own inner peace, helping to create a more peaceful world for now into the future. Thank you.